Hello and welcome to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spice Soup. It's time to get fired up. Make sure you find the Raptor Show or if you listen to podcasts, uh, subscribe and please interview the program. As a programming note, we have obviously moved from the afternoon to uh, the morning. Uh, our new time slot is 11 to 12, so check us out daily there. Uh, I've been your host, Will Lou. I'm joined by co-host Blake Murphy. What's going on, Blake? Uh, a lot. Oh, apparently a lot um, is going on yeah yeah quite the news cycle before yesterday's game um you know it means we don't have to talk as much about a 96 88 loss uh where neither team even shot 25 percent on threes it was the closest thing to the media game that uh, oh. that the public will will get to oh, see man. um ugly game uh ugly day in terms of the reporting around the toronto raptors as well with the sure. Dante porter uh allegations yeah we'll we'll talk about those first and foremost uh and also joining us in the studio Friend of the program, Big V, Vivek Jacob. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. Always here for the serious topics. That's why you brought me in, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're, you know, I, I was just reading your piece on Raptors and Seven about what the Raptors should do with Gary Trent Jr. in the offseason, and I actually wanted to have that discussion with you. Obviously, a bigger story emerged, so we'll get to that uh, in, in segment two. The big story that everyone's talking about right now um, in the NBA, improbably, is Jonte Porter, which obviously... It is not about his play. It's actually about the lack thereof of his play because the NBA is investigating betting irregularities, particularly for two games uh, via DraftKings um, involving Toronto Raptors forward, Jonte Porter. You've already heard the story by now. It was broken on ESPN. Um, Jonte obviously has been out for the last two games, listed out with personal reasons, but I think we know what those personal reasons are right now. And um, yeah, I just wanted to get your general thoughts because... For me, being down in the arena last night, seeing this story break in real time, it broke around 5.30ish, which is usually when everyone's just kind of mingling around in the tunnels of the Scotiabank Arena. Seeing that news break in real time and seeing people sort of like run around and scramble and just sort of figure out what's going on was quite the experience. But I wanted to get your thoughts, Blake, on... uh, you know, the allegations around John Tante Porter. Yeah, I mean, foremost, uh, it felt like something like this was bound to happen eventually in the NBA. Um, we've seen on the NFL side, um, Calvin Ridley suspended for the entire 2020-2022 season uh, for placing parlays on not on his team while he was on the injured list. Uh, last year, an additional 10 NFL players were suspended uh, over the course of the, the 2023 calendar year to where at the end of the season, the NFL had to rework its gambling policy and make it more strict on players uh, betting on NFL action, harsher automatic punishments and things like that. Of course, the main sports news cycle outside of March Madness this last week or so has also been Shohei Otani and the accusations against uh, his interpreter, um, whether that's for the gambling side of that, for the theft from Shohei Otani to cover the the gambling losses. Um, And the reality of this is as sports betting becomes kind of more and more omnipresent uh, around sports and sports culture um it felt like something like this was was probably going to happen eventually unfortunately uh the league and the players union for decades honestly well before sports betting was legal in some states or or legal in canada uh, have been trying to educate players about this there's obviously the tim donaghy scandal uh, from a a decade back or so Um, but the nba and mbpa have been have tried to be on top of this for a very very long time because sports betting has existed uh, and the incentives or, or risks to to have guys do this have existed long before this stuff was legal and omnipresent but that kind of heavy presence obviously makes it more front of mind more accessible and things like that mm-hmm. um so that's one thought on this the second is that this is incredibly disappointing it would be an incredibly disappointing error in judgment if this is true by mm-hmm. the way we should say there there are right now they're investigating the betting irregularities Jonte Porter is being held out of action while that goes on. Um, but there is nothing to say at this point in the process that Jonte placed those bets or X, Y, Z happened. So this is all just alleged right now. If what is alleged is true and it traces back to Jonte not only having, um, you know, a lot, whether placing the bets themselves or, or enticing other people to bet. Um, and the the implication here being that, you know, he knowingly pulled himself out of games and, and hit his under. That would be any sort of gambling that violates the league and union agreed upon rules would be uh, a really disappointing error in judgment. Um, betting on yourself, on your own team, while you could understand it would be a very disappointing error in judgment. But what is implied here through and, and will be alleged here is that 
you knowingly bet against yourself mm -hmm. and withdrew your performance from the team. So again, it's not, nobody has yet to say that, hey, Jonte bet on this and intentionally did this. It could be something, you know, there are, there are other explanations, though they feel less plausible with the information that we have right now. Regardless, this is incredibly disappointing, incredibly disappointing for the league, for the team, um, for Jonte Porter, if, again, if, if what is alleged can be traced back to, to his actions and him having knowledge of that, um, it's just a huge error in judgment. You could even get into the, the risk reward part of it. Like obviously ethically it's really bad, mm -hmm. but also like, like your, your judgment in terms of what the future of your career looks like versus what you're making off of this. It, it, there's, there's no way around right. how, how disappointing this is. And unfortunately how kind of inevitable it has felt, not necessarily with Jonte, but as this stuff kind of continues to pick up steam around sports. Okay, Vivek, um, what was your reaction when you saw this break last night? Uh, it's just sad. You know, when, when you think of uh, the disappointing factor, you think of the way that, you know, he's worked his way back into the league and the things that he's been through uh, injury-wise and just to have this opportunity again to potentially throw it away. Again, we don't know what's going to come of the investigation. Uh, I, th I think it, it would just be a sad way for things to play out after, you know, you think about all the things that have gone wrong for the Raptors this season, among the few things that have gone right, is this John Tay Porter feel good story. Mm -hmm. And so if, if it were to end this way, it, it would be extremely disappointing. Um, for me, I think whichever way uh, this plays out, the NBA has to recognize its part uh, in this. Mm -hmm and the possibility of this. Uh, and I think they have to take serious measures. You ask about, uh, you know, what are some of the first things I thought about? You know, I was uh, a, cri a kid watching cricket mm -hmm. and there was a huge match fixing scandal that broke out in the early 2000s. Okay. And uh, there were big players involved who got banned for life. Mm. One was the captain of the Indian cricket team. Like we were talking about right, like, right. big players. Right, of course. Um, I, I don't think there'll be that necessarily to worry about because uh, cricketers weren't making as much money at the time. Mm -hmm. And here, the premier, or the best players in the league are very well taken care of. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think they'll be carried away with bookies uh, and things like that. But I think especially the second round picks, especially guys on 10-day contracts, uh, those are the ones that, you know, bookies will be circling like sharks. Uh, and they'll be saying, okay, can we get in with any of these guys and, and try to work our way in? Um, and I think that's where you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. Cricket, once that broke out, they created an entire anti-corruption team to make sure none of this happens again. Right. right? Um, and, and so I think the NBA has to be very serious in terms of mitigating this stuff completely, uh, you know, doing whatever they can to keep these players out, out of the loop. Yeah, I think if we go big picture on this, right, um, if if you as a league decide to go into partnering directly with sports books in this case, and the NBA has done this on pretty much every single level. And more is coming. And more is the coming. league pass integration. Right. Um, first off, this isn't unique. I mean, sports gambling is, is kind of a fact of life, and it's going to continue to be so. And, of course, when you do directly partner with them, though, like that's where you need to make sure that, above all else, the integrity of your sport is the core of your business. And no matter what kind of partnership you go into, um, there needs to be a very heavy consideration, as you mentioned, that you actually maintain and protect that. Because I think on a bigger picture, that's what's really uh, the difficulty for the NBA is, are you able to maintain your integrity as a sport? And of course, this is something that happened on a very small scale. Uh, whether John T. Porter left games intentionally to hit the unders for some prop bets, which honestly is... <laughs> risk reward wise it's like one or two k for a prop bet versus like you make 400k for your salary i don't think anyone would you know sensibly wager in that kind of fashion without it being just characterized as a very very big miscalculation and just very stupid in general again that's what's alleged to have happened um but in any case the, the league itself needs to make sure that you do not compromise your integrity and the trust in your product first and foremost. And look, the NBA would tell you that they are doing that. And and DraftKings has already issued a statement uh, via a spokesman yesterday that, and look, 
what I'm about to say, like you can roll your eyes at it and there is maybe a level of naivete to it. But, you know, DraftKings says that actually this is one of the benefits of regulating sports betting okay. um, is that you can catch irregularities like this, where if it is only illicit markets, you know, Shohei's uh, translator, for example, the way that they have stumbled upon that is, well, the California government was investigating an illegal bookmaker and then saw all these wire transfers. It wasn't, mm -hmm. hey, yeah. there's a $500,000 bet being made on this thing and it raises a flag. So DraftKings has come out and said via spokesman, actually, this is the system working. The NBA has um, for years, but certainly more so in recent years, as this all becomes uh, legal in more states, um, have data scientists who are on top of it. Like there is a, they don't call it this, but basically an integrity team. Mm -hmm. And every team is supposed to have representatives who have an eye out for that stuff as well. Um, and obviously in the era of the era of big data yeah. um, and, and, you know, if league partners are filtered, like, like ESPN got this story in part because they're like, they are a DraftKings partner. So when DraftKings sees these irregularities, you know, they can raise the flag to ESPN. If I, I don't remember. I love who, that the story was brought to you by DraftKings, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's no irony. And, in this. and look, there is a, there is a thick irony. And, yeah. you know, if you, if you want to be more critical hypocrisy to a lot of the, the reporting that'll go, like we have betting sponsors on, on sports and it, it, everyone does uh, around sports media. Um, anyway, so DraftKings would tell you, the league would tell you, other betting sites would tell you, actually the regulation helps because we can catch stuff like this. Now, whether you believe that, whether you think that outweighs the kind of extra illicit incentives for players because it is so big, there is so much money, it is so kind of ubiquitous, um, you know, that's that's for you to make the judgment. But the league and these places will stand by, hey, actually, this is the system working. We can catch this stuff. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, the data systems to, to raise these red flags and look at them a little more closely. So um, the leagues are trying. It just, I don't know that you're ever going to keep up with the kind of ingenuity of bad actors. Yeah, in, in this case, ingenuity is too generous because if, yeah. the, if the scheme is what it seems to be, yeah, the I mean, pattern is what it seems to be. You did not cover that up. How is, like, come on, man. This is like, who, first off, who is who in the right mind is even betting on Jante Porter-Unders? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Like, no, for real. Like, I, Look, as someone who has bemoaned the fact in the past that I can't bet on G League games, uh -huh. um, probably me, yeah. but um, <laughs> not to that level, right? Like, but, but seriously, though, and for that to be the number one money-making play on twice. two separate incidents where he left the game, it's like you can definitely see not just how a very sophisticated data team could find this. I think anyone looking at this will be connect like... Connect the dots. Mm, like, <laughs> what are you doing here? Which, again, like... You know, it's not like you can bet an infinite amount of money on on the prop bets. Like, it's like one or two thousand on a, a prop like this. I think there was the reporting that uh, that Woj had passed along that like there were certain bets that people wanted to make ten or even twenty k bets mm -hmm. on this. How is not that like the biggest red flag of like who is that confident on John T. Porter hitting an under? 0.5 on threes like come on man and, and that's part of it and then the lower limits and yes usually it's one to two thousand on, on an individual player prop those vary a little bit by site okay, and sure. by the prop yeah. specifically you know DraftKings, who who again are, are the ones who first flag this yeah. um they say on their site there's a twenty thousand dollar cap on player props in general and specials um so that's like at the absolute mm -hmm. absolute max but i think that's like spread out over a lot and then yeah you can parlay some of these things together to make it bigger um we have had uh one other anonymous sports book report to espn that yeah we saw this activity too mm -hmm. so when you're talking about the small limits you're now talking about for this to be even remotely worthwhile and worth the risk you know is there a system of hey multiple people over multiple accounts over multiple sites i think that's probably what they're looking into now to see exactly what the scope of this is yeah well i mean that's the thing it's like you and this is not a question that you guys can really answer but one of the questions i had for this and something i'm looking forward to finding out the answer to is was jante acting alone right were were there people that he was directing on this you know um honestly <laughs> was there a coordination beyond jante as well which again I, I this is all complete just questions like that, mm -hmm. that's questions that i just want to have you know what i mean and i guess the other thing is what kind of punishment could come out of something like this because obviously it is strictly inhibit uh, prohibited for nba players to you know I, and again right now we don't even know if he specifically bet on his own performances hopefully he didn't i mean that would be even you know more ridiculous and and, and quite frankly stupid but um yeah just quickly for people who don't know yeah NBA players cannot gamble on anything that's NBA, WNBA, or G League. Right. Or Summer League.
Yeah, stuff like uh, esports, you're not allowed to bet on as well, just because. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Anything uh, under the NBA umbrella. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, what what's the punishment for something like this? So there isn't precedent in okay. the NBA. There's no example of this, and even the precedents in other sports. You know, I mentioned earlier the NFL. Calvin really got a whole season, and he wasn't betting on his own team. He wasn't even playing. Uh, he was out injured. There were ten suspensions during the NFL season last year, and the new NFL policy um, is it's an auto suspension. Um, they, again, they made it more strict at the end of the season because they have these gambling policies, and they're like, we suspended ten guys for gambling this year. We got to make it more strict. Sure. So okay. um, it's an automatic. I believe it's an automatic one year and in some cases automatic two year um, depending on what specifically you bet and whether your team is involved whether you are, you are involved the nba as far as i know has not publicly released their gambling mm-hmm. policy and what the punishment scale is there's no precedent for us to go on yeah. um, i would imagine they want to come down very hard especially like like you're gonna to want to come down hard for a lot of reasons the the integrity and ethics reason the yep. send a message reason etc but like extra so if if this ends up being verified and Jonte had a hand in it, the, the fact that you were betting against yourself and against your mm-hmm. your performance for your team is is a little extra. Um, so we'll see in that regard. The other thing, and to your point, uh, be about, you know, what is the scale of this? How many people were involved? Was there a system? Um, depending on the jurisdiction and what jurisdiction this would fall under, mm-hmm. there are potential criminal punishments yeah, as yeah. well. Tim Donaghy went to jail right. for 15 months. The Canadian Criminal Code has an entire section about influencing sports betting and things like that mm-hmm. um you know i'm not a, a a lawyer but in reading that stuff this morning it certainly seems like you know if the jurisdiction were deemed to be canada here and this was a larger scale thing they might want to get in on and the investigation as well see some of the see if there's a case there as well so um you know as this thing as we understand the the scale of this more mm-hmm. um yeah i think the the scope of the potential punishments only increases um there's just no in the nba precedent to go on on the 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 only so outside of the nfl in the nhl shane pinto uh, was suspended for 41 games this season but in that case that was something that pinto the nhl and the nhlpa agreed upon we never actually got the details the smoking gun any confirmation or anything like okay. that the sides came to uh, an agreement before it got to that point so uh, again not much helpful precedent anywhere in this case um there's obviously a large a much larger conversation to be had about just a promotion of sports gambling, especially now that it's become more and more widespread and not just uh, legalized in, in many areas, but also become more culturally like acceptable in North America. And obviously places like uh, most of the rest of the world actually had already legalized sports betting to this point. Um, if you watch the Premier League, for example, like half the teams are pr- brought to you by some sort of um, sports book. Um, but in any case, in North America, and, and we're seeing this sort of effect um, take over the NBA quite a bit. You, again, you see lots of partnerships. The Raptors have direct partnerships. You know, every team in the league basically is in the same boat here. Um, is there a larger conversation to be had for you guys? And this is just a personal preference because, you know, I, I'm not expecting you guys to be experts specific on this. But, you know, of course, you guys are, you know, heavily involved in sports and you guys are seen as sports experts um, on a show like this. Is there a larger conversation to have for you guys in terms of how sports betting is marketed um, across the board and maybe even the saturation of of it uh, across, like, you know, the presentation of sports in North America? I think definitely in terms of how we converse about it or how we preview games or things like that, you know, when you see people sort of taking the dialogue of a preview for a game or a series or whatever into, you know, under the umbrella of, hey, these are the props and so this is what you should be looking for. Right. I, I think that takes away from just talking about the game itself. So I think that's what you've always got to keep at the forefront. Mm-hmm. You talk about the game, you talk about the teams, and then, you know, people will make their decisions. Obviously, there's risks involved. You have to evaluate uh, your own financial circumstances with everything that you do. And so uh, I think we, as presenters or, you know, commenters on all of this, we have to be cognizant of that. And, you know, this is, this is not our, our money. <laughs> that we're playing right, right. for sure yeah. uh, and, and so i think that's the main thing that we need to be aware of when we're speaking to the general public and so um being informative about the game being informative about what we're watching is the main goal um and then let people take away from that whatever they want mm. yeah for me personally i mean look i like full disclosure yeah. i have bet on sports my entire life like mm. since the since i first had um you know, some disposable income, not a lot of disposable income. I mean, you, you know, my backstory, uh, yeah, yeah. not a lot, but like 
since like yeah since university probably i've been betting on on sports and obviously that was not legal for a long time or, or you had to go through you know back channels or, or whatever right um, Take a trip to vegas type of deal. yeah but i have been doing that and like i i it's naive to think for me to think that everyone is going to approach sports betting the way i do which is that make sports a little more fun i understand the math i understand that over the long run even a smart sports person who is number savvy but doesn't have like a machine learning system like mm -hmm. like it's a losing proposition over the long run that's a small part the house and, always wins yeah and like when i was on the morning show and we do wake and rake and things like that you know i was very i tried to be very very clear that hey this is like a small part of my personal entertainment budget i'm not trying to get rich off of it i'm not trying to make money i'm trying to hey there's a big ufc event tonight i don't care about these two fighters let, let me have a stake in this and, and it makes it a little bit more entertaining that is how i've always approached sports betting um, and that's not, you know, it, that's not universal, though. And, and I think that it's naive to think that it, it would be universally applied and there aren't risks. To it. There's a reason you can't advertise, um, you know, cigarettes. There's a reason you can't advertise alcohol and things like that. Um, there are big risks here. And, and I know that a lot of the sports books and, and the leagues themselves, they try to provide you with the resources if, if you're having mm -hmm. trouble and things like that. Um, but yeah obviously as you introduce more of this stuff and we just went through it you know a handful of years ago with the uh, decriminalization and legalization of marijuana right like some of these same risks were there so some of the same things had to be you know sorted out in the initial years um it's not a perfect example but as like these things happen um it's sports betting is not the not the first thing um that's dealt with stuff like that anyway yes the bigger picture conversation it's it's really really unfortunate and scary that jb bickerstaff is getting death threats or threats about his family that tyrese halliburton is enjoying playing less because all he hears courtside is stuff about prop bets and parlays and stuff like that um you know this is the reality i don't know how you walk it back to where like like some of the onus falls on those individuals to be a little bit more reasonable but i i don't know like i don't know how you put the toothpaste back in the tube mm -hmm. at this point if it's going to stay legalized in terms of that the insidious side of the culture around it so um again like uh, like recognizing that everything has betting sponsors we have one i, I do the pregame hits and stuff like that yeah, of course I, I you know my personal and, and i'm a member of sports media my, my personal line has been well i don't like other than the the morning show the couple months that i did that like i'm i'm not giving picks i'm not talking about the bets that is for me like where i have to personally i, I feel like i need to draw the line um, other people feel differently. Other outlets feel differently. Um, you know, I, I know it got pointed out a lot that ESPN ran that story yesterday, the same day or the day after one of their panelists was talking about this is a risk-free investment when it came to a, a bet on one of the college games, um, which obviously no no bet is a risk-free investment. Anyway, so there is a lot of irony and, and yes, to some degree hypocrisy to sort through here. Um, I don't have an answer other than that you know, you'd hope that silver lining to stuff like this in the Shohei thing is that it's a wake up call to the leagues that they have not and legislators, I guess, too, that like, as this is all rolled out, we have not done a good enough job, you know, making sure the the messaging and the safeguards are, are quite in place from the start. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think for me, um, again, circling back to this, the biggest thing is you cannot lose the credibility and integrity of your sport, right? Like, Honestly, this is, might just be me being so invested in the Toronto Raptors. But one of my first reactions to, to the whole news with Jonte potentially, like, taking himself out of games so to make sure that they hit the unders is, like, you're sabotaging a Raptors performance. And, like, I get it. It's the lost season. You're the third-string center. It's not the biggest thing. It's not, like, if LeBron would, like, take himself out of the game. You know what I mean? Like, it, that obviously, that would have a much bigger impact. But ultimately, like, like the integrity... Of the sport 100%. is like the main thing that's what we're all sort of banking on that's what we're all you know investing to see as a fan you're trying to see a true competition and you want to see um the competition be the most important thing that's why you know for you like i i agree with that approach it's like it's a it's a ideally it's a secondary thing everything is secondary to the fact that you know there is an integrity of what you're competing with here and the nba has to be very very careful on something like this because they've literally already had scandals Yep. involving officials it took them so long to get past and uh, it, whether yeah, they even right. got past the tim donaghy thing for sure but like anytime there's a bad call in a meaningful spot in a game now and yeah. we've been through this with the raptors like the game that darko blew up at the refs or whatever yeah you know i had dms about like the league's conspiracy theories and stuff like that it's like yeah. it's like okay i don't like 
there were what was it rudy gobert thought the league when he got fined 100k he did for, the money sign yeah. yeah and then like afterwards it's like yeah the league has the fix in for the sacramento kings it's like okay well let's be reasonable about where the fix okay. would be but anytime this kind of stuff comes and there's a reason rudy got slapped with such a big fine why darko got fined why the coaches get fined when they they question the you know the referees and things like that is that yeah the league has the league has always on the player and coach side, yeah. you know, fiercely protected the integrity of the game. If you suggest otherwise, they came down hard on Tim Donaghy and, and put more safeguards in place on the referee side and things like that. But that has only, you know, that only applies to like the player and coach side. Right. But again, the main thing has to be the main thing. Yeah. Nothing secondary can jeopardize the main thing. But I think uh, going to the sports media side, and it's not like, you know, again, you've already pointed it out. The fact that like, you know, every, a lot of sports media sites, ours included, um, have partnerships with sports books, but the big question for me is like, okay, these are the big sponsors that are that are actually stepping up and actually bringing money to these enterprises, and the reality of the situation for a lot of shows and a lot of programs on sports is like that is what's going to fund them going forward. I mean, yeah. you know, when you look at a long term model, I, I always look at the EPL for example, or any sort of soccer leagues. It's like those are direct partnerships that they've worked with for a very long time. And that actually is just the reality of like where all the chips end up falling is that sports books are a huge part of sports. Um, but again, there needs to be safeguards and safe rails put into place. You know what I mean? Like I think a lot of people have a question about, okay, how does advertising like this hit children, for example, right? Um, how does that develop habits in younger players who may not have, again, the wherewithal to be able to do it responsibly? You know what I mean? And, and of course, there are ideally guardrails in place. And the fact of any society is that you can't protect everybody from the downsides of any potential re decision. And, you know, there, there are obviously facets that come into that. But, yeah, in general, though, like, the integrity of the sport must be maintained. And I, that's why this whole situation is incredibly disappointing. And that's why so many people are talking about it. I, again, from a Raptors perspective, I guess you can wonder or not if he's going to be involved. But, again, depending on how this, like, investigation Holds, like I would be very surprised if he played another game for the Toronto Raptors. If he ten is, games left, well, not just that, but like, yeah, I mean, I, I don't even know about his future in the league. Again, depending on how directly involved he was with some of this stuff, and of course, you can always point to the tangential stuff uh, relating to it. He seems like he was he's been really big into, uh, let's just say, financially risky decisions. Um, yeah, I mean, we could just say it. Like, he has a history of tweeting about of about crypto and stock yeah, market stuff. That's and circumstantial, and, man. and it, it is. Yeah. And, and like, obviously, if you're, you know, if you like, crypto is a thing you can legally invest in and make yeah, money and stuff sure. like that. Yeah. Like, there's nothing. Same with the stock market. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, and those those are the account that is pretty safely traced back to him. Also, uh, Adam Lascaris did, did some digging on that. Um, you know, has also engaged with sports betting stuff in the past, but none of that means mm -hmm. that you did this necessarily, right? For it sure. just means that you've been public about other ways that you look to invest and find, you know, financial opportunities, which doesn't mean you did this. Mm. Uh, you guys want to talk Raptors Nets? Yeah, Raptors. we want to take a break first and then... Then come back and do Nets? Nah, we, we got like five minutes on this. Let's, let, right. let's, let's, let's just bang this one out. Uh, well, I want one takeaway from both of you guys on the Raptors losing 96-88 to 88 against the Brooklyn Nets? Me? For me, I, I mean, getting an opportunity to watch Kobe Simmons, I thought he had some nice minutes. Mm. I, I thought he had, hustled on the defensive end. I thought, you know, he had that, uh, I mean, he got a screen from uh, Mohamed Abye and then was able to get downhill against Dennis Schroeder and get that nice runner. He had a pull-up three. Yep. Um, and so I thought he had some nice minutes, showed some flashes. Uh, so if I were to take one... Uh, if I had one takeaway from this game, mm -hmm. I'll go with him just because, you know, we've seen most of the other guys play. <laughs> the, the the big takeaway from the Jonte Porter scandal game is 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 Kobe Simmons. Okay, Blake, yours. I watched Grady Dick and Ochai Abaji run a successful pick and pop. Oh. W yesterday, yeah. which is like Ochai Abaji okay. hitting an above the break three has been fairly rare. We talked the last week about, you know, mm -hmm. Grady doesn't do a ton of operating in the pick and roll right now. You know, that's not something they, they've asked him to do a ton of. So we got both of those things in one game, in one play. Um, that was the, I mean, this this game was ugly. Oh, ugly, it was nasty. Ugly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned it earlier. Both 14, teams. 14 for 66 combined three-point shooting. Oh man, yeah, that was it was a it was a tough performance. There's no doubt, um, but you know they did compete. And and for me, my takeaway was, Garrett Temple, Raptor show favorite, continues to be <laughs> one of the only like like guys on the Raptors that like consistently knows what he's doing. Of course, like he should. He's like 37. He's been a long time maybe a player. 
all that kind of stuff. And I even thought back to the interview that we did and we were like, you know, Garrett, that does feel a little bit like we're patting on the head of like, okay, you can still play well. But it's actually similar to like what we did with Thad too because when you don't see a guy play for a while and you, they get into the game, like you don't know what to expect. And but for Garrett, he's come in and actually done a decent job. And of course, it's never some sort of overwhelming thing, right? Like, yeah, two points last night, three rebounds, uh, four assists, a steal. But he just, he plays the right way. He's he's doing the right things, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. And... Dare I say, there's a there's a case to be made that he should play even more minutes if the Raptors, you know, agenda here is to like be as competitive as possible. Which obviously at this point we know it's a balance between many things. I yeah. think you could make the case that he should play a little bit more, even if the goal is not to be as competitive as possible. It's just like he does bring like competent structure, similar to yeah. how like early in the season, any time Otto Porter played, even though he didn't do that much, the team played better. It's just like. Like the app. Like, wow, you didn't like, you weren't <laughs> terrible. And like, like obviously yeah. when you're trying to compete at the highest level, the most important thing is having good players, having great mm -hmm. players. But when you are at this level and you've lost 11 games in a row, yeah. replacing a non NBA level player with a guy who just like has a floor and can yeah, be right. safe and be competent and, and like understand the offense and know where to be in defense like that. It, it's really lower in the bar, but that really does raise your level of play. Yeah, it's just the trust factor, right? Like it, mm -hmm. when we watch Kelly Olynyk on the floor and he's on the offensive end, you know, that you know you can go to him as a hub. The young guys can rely on him and, and just move off him and work off him. Right. And, and so I think it's just that trust factor with Garrett Temple that you know what he's going to bring to the table when he comes in the game. Mm -hmm. You got, which, a, uh, you got a spicy which, stat or take off of that? Which does bring me very conveniently. Wow, I can't believe it worked like this. Uh, time now for today's spicy take, or uh, I guess this is a spicy stat, brought to you by new Chunky Spicy Soup. Are you ready to get fired up? This one, honestly, I got to give Blake the, the props for this one because he suggested it and I really did like it. Uh, Raptors in their last three games, obviously have, have lost the last three. They've lost 11 straight. They've lost by a combined 31 points. As you would expect, pretty much every single Raptor is a minus during this time. There is only one person who was even better than a plus one in the last three games combined, it is Raptor show favorite, Garrett Temple. Garrett Temple is a plus 14 in the last three games where she's played around 45 minutes, which honestly, again, the Raptors have lost all three games. One of them was not particularly close, uh, and he was still a plus in that one. Yeah, he, he's been a positive contributor in that stretch. Um, my question to you guys, I mean, there's, there's certain guys, the starting lineup obviously has been getting killed. Bruce Brown's a minus 30. Uh, Kelly Olenek's a minus 27. Ochai's a minus 25. Um, you know, things like that. But my question to you guys, who are the other two Raptors who are actually a plus one in this three game stretch? Javias Ramsey. That's a good guess, but no, he's a, he's a, he's a minus two. He was a plus okay. nine in one of the games and there was a minus 11 in the other one. Damn. And then obviously he got, uh, he's not on the team yesterday. What's right? He, he's not, he wasn't, I mean, Javias oh, wasn't yes. on the team. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. I thought that was a hint. No, 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 no. <laughs> There's no hints for that. Um, yeah. Well, the last three games. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, Kobe Simmons. Kobe Simmons, yes, very good. Plus one last night. Okay. Yeah. And then I don't know. Yeah. Grady. No, Grady. Uh, Grady's played better. Minus Grady twelve. A, he, I know he was a plus last night. Yeah. He's getting a lot of threes up, which is nice. Yeah. Who's um, the other one? Let's go with Darius. <laughs> no, the other one's someone we talked about quite a bit. Jonte Porter. Oh. Yeah. Cool. The segment got pretty dark once again. Uh, plus one in uh, his 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 twenty minutes. He actually played well in that game. Um, you know. Lesson Played up well in, in a lot of games. Must have not been the prop, that one. But in any case, uh, we are going to take this break. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spice Suit. When we come back, let's talk about Gary Trent Jr. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Owen Lou. We'll continue to be joined by co host Blake Murphy and guest Vex Jacob uh, V, as I mentioned in our, our segment one. Um, you know, you have your own Substack, Raptors and Seven. Going Correct. straight to my inbox. Tell me about your Substack first and also what you wrote about this week. Uh, yeah, with the Substack, I started it a few weeks ago, beginning with uh, a post about Scotty Barnes and, you know, a lot of takes about, you know, where he's at in his career. Obviously, largely positive. Um, but I think with the Substack, I just wanted to have something where uh, I could consistently just write in my own voice and, um, you know, I think with the way media is trending, uh, independent media, I think is going to be more, more of a thing. And so I just wanted to, you know, take a bit of a risk with that and mm -hmm. see where, see where it lands. And yeah, so for this week's post, uh, it was the three year anniversary of the Gary Trent Jr. Norman Powell 
um, trade okay. uh, yesterday. And so I thought it would be a good time to kind of look back on that trade, look ahead to free agency, the way Gary Trent Jr. has performed as a Raptor, and kind of figure out maybe, you know, what's uh, what's the optimal uh, outcome for the Raptors going mm. into this offseason. Okay. Um, so there's obviously going to be a big question, right? Because, uh, again, this offseason, you got to choose to decide whether you're going to re-sign him or not. He's unrestricted. He had picked up his player option for this season to return to the Raptors. Um, I think that probably does indicate that there wasn't that strong of a market um, last offseason. I don't think he was coming off the greatest year last year as well. Having said that, though, this year has kind of been difficult to evaluate, not just him, but pretty much every Raptor, but I think especially for Gary because he started the season coming off with the second unit. Um, I don't think he's ever necessarily looked all that comfortable playing with the second unit for extended stretches. He's gone back into the sign lineup uh, as partially because of the function of how much roster turnover, but generally speaking, he's actually been kind of productive recently. He's been leading the team in scoring. So there is a question in terms of, A, just how productive is Gary and also like um, what the Raptors should do in the offseason, especially uh, in terms of a contract potentially. But like, what have you made of Gary Trent's uh, season so far this year? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you know that the Gary Trent's better as a starter thing kind of uh, annoys me because every okay. role player in the league would be better as a starter playing around better players and things like that. He also has shot better as a reserve in his career. So the numbers don't even back it up. It just kind of feels that way. Okay. Um, right. Having said that, he has been their most reliable source of offense during this period where everyone's out. Um, basically, the only guy who can get his own shot and basically the only guy who can score without Kelly Olenek spoon-feeding them buckets, um, which is great. <laughs> yeah, sure. And I think in terms of his value, he's had, like on the market, he's had a down year. His counting stats are down. Um, we didn't see the you know playmaking progression maybe you, you'd like to see. The defense hasn't got back to the level it was the one year where he had taken a step forward. Hasn't been as bad as last year in my estimation, but you know things like steals are down and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I think the most important thing for him when it comes to the market is he just turned 25 and he is once again having another really, really good season from three. He's at 40% on threes. We're now looking at a five-year run here where he's hit at worst 36.9% of his threes on high volume. Over those five years, we're talking over 2,000 attempts. He's just shy of 39%. Um, that is the 18th most threes hit in the NBA over the last five years. And of those top 20 guys, it's the number six percentage. So this is like one of the premier high volume catch and shoot three point guys in the league. So if you're talking about what his value is in the open market, a 25 year old who's a safe bet to hit down, hit 39% of his threes on like six, seven threes a game is a really like, that's a stable thing. That's a, there is a consistency there um, that has a lot of value. I think though, relative to the last time he was a free agent and relative to even if he had opted out this past summer, I don't know that anyone anymore is pricing in further development from right him. He's, no potential even though yeah. he's only 25 which is young on the age scale i think given what we've seen over the last couple of years given where his game is he is who he is mm. and that's okay. fine that's a really valuable piece given the three-point shooting in the modern nba um but i i think you know if he had been a, if he had explored free agency more aggressively when he got that three-year deal even this past off season some teams might have been like well he might develop more he might get this in his game what if we expand his role this way and i i don't think you're there anymore i think he's his market will be, hey, this is a really steady three-point shooter, and that's his primary, you know, kind of marketing asset. Yeah, I, I do like the fact that, um, well, number one, I, I think you do have to appreciate him, what he's brought as a professional. I think he's, he's you know, been always really good to, to speak to. I think he's, um, you know, been available for games. And, um, you know, even the last couple of games, like I, I do – at least in these difficult times in terms of like, okay, the Raptors are on this extended losing streak. They got a lot of players missing. Like, are you still playing hard? Are you still trying to compete your very best? And I still do see that from Gary. Like the last seven games, and this is obviously, you know, where he's been a lot more prominent. Um, but he's he's averaged like 24 points a game, shooting 44% from the field. He's shooting nine threes a game, hitting 37% of those. That's really good, especially again, because nobody's really generating these for him anymore. Um but having said that, though, I do have some questions in terms of, number one, how does he fit with the starting five? Because you do see that the Raptors do have four starters locked in. Is he going to be that fifth starter for you? And if not, is he going to be a productive bench player for you? Um, and that's, I know, Rebecca, that's something you explored in your piece. So is Gary that fifth starter that fits with this group? And is that something you're comfortable with long term? Because that's obviously going to determine a huge part of, A, what he's back and also what he's back for. Yeah, first off, I think, to your point, he's been an absolute consummate professional. Right. And I think he has shown up to work every day. You look at the game, even in Washington, he's dealing with the back stiffness, but he's there for the team. He plays, he gives it his all uh, and, you know, struggles from three, which shows, 
you know, with, with the back struggles, but he's there for the team. And so I think uh, that's something you have to factor in. I think when you look at the fit with the starting group, they've had a plus 10 net rating. That unit with Gary Trent Jr., uh, Jakob Pertl, Scotty Barnes, Emmanuel Quickly, and R.J. Barrett. That's pretty good. And so that's, okay. that's encouraging. And the thing that surprises me is uh, they had a defensive rating of, of around 109, which is comparable to the starting fives of Minnesota and Boston, right? Now, the big difference is that the Raptors uh, starting group, they only played 160 minutes together. Okay, all right, fair. And you had those other two teams with over 500 minutes uh, of a sample size. And so you would expect somewhat of a correction, at least, right? But I do think when you think of the theoretical fit with the way Jacoberto plays, with the way Scotty Barnes plays, with the way RJ Barrett attacks the rim, Gary Trent's offensive fit is pretty seamless. And so... Uh, it's about, you know, what are Jakob Pertl and Scotty Barnes doing to protect the basket uh, with those other three around that is allowing them uh, to look pretty good defensively or good enough defensively to do what they can uh, offensively. And, and I think that's where I can see Gary Trent Jr. as a short-term solution. Um, I think if I were to just, you know, think of the prototype I would want next to those four, it would be more of a 3 and D guy. Okay. And it would be someone who is a switchable defender. Uh, and that's part of what kind of intrigues me about the likes of an Ochai Abaji, you know? The, right. I think you're pretty, his, you're pretty high on Ochai. I mean, I think his absolute ceiling is being a, a 3 and D starter. Okay. Right? I, I think most people would probably say, hey, can you just be a rotation guy? Which might be what, what he nets out as. Um, but I think if he can really start to knock down the 3 then you, you can see that kind of ceiling. But I, I think overall, obviously, <laughs> you think of what you would dream of in this scenario is, mm. is having like an OGM. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> right? all right. Uh, and it's going to cost you $40 million, so, you know. <laughs> But I think that's what you're looking for at that position, unless RJ Barrett really trends upwards defensively, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that can kind of change uh, how you view this. But I think next to Emmanuel Quickly, next to RJ Barrett, you want someone who can be that guy you look at, you know, the opposing team's best scorer and be like, okay, this is what we got for you. Okay. Like, how do you evaluate Gary's defense? Not well. Okay. Um, I think he has a real knack for getting into uh, a guy's dribble mm -hmm. and being able to, when he's up in a jersey, poke balls free and create offense the other way off of that, which is a very valuable skill. Um, but I think that sometimes that comes at the expense of more sound defense, keeping a man in front of him. Um, that was a little more acceptable in the Nick Nurse era when OG was around and other guys were, were there as well. And it was a better defensive ecosystem because there were more guys to cover for that. Uh, that scheme prioritized taking those kind of gambles, whether right, right. at the nail, the elbow extended, even on your man, um, you know, letting a guy be, beat you over the screen and trying to poke it free from behind or rearview contest. Like those were kind of their principles then. In a team like team scenario like this, um, where it's a little more conservative, where the defensive talent around him isn't as much. Um, maybe with Jakob Pertl healthy, you, you can get there a little bit with the paint protection. Mm. Um, but those risks are riskier in this environment. And I don't think he's been able to scale that part of his nature back and be more sound. I don't think he's the worst defender in the NBA, um, but I don't think he's as good as, you know, the fact that he averaged 1.7 steals the one year and, and had trended upward. Like he's not, he's not that level of a guy. Uh, he's not that large also. Um, which, you know, when you're already playing quickly and, and RJ at, at two right, spots, right. you'd probably like someone uh, a little bit bigger uh, nominally. So, but wouldn't um, you want someone to, to defend the point of attack, though? Because I feel like Scotty can be, like, probably your wing defender, and then you need a guy who can guard the guards. And Sure, but I don't, I don't think that's Gary Trent Jr. And okay. I think, I think right, it, with what you're about to pay Emmanuel quickly, he has to become that guy. Yeah. Uh, and he's, he certainly has not done a great job of that since he's arrived in Toronto. He's, okay. a, he's a much better team-level defender than point-of-attack defender. Mm -hmm. But that is the challenge for me. Like, like, the way you're about to pay right. Emmanuel quickly, he needs to be probably that guy for you. Like, you, you can't have someone else do that job. You're, I mean, not, a, not a unless you're committing to both. playing pretty small. Because generally, like, right. I, I get it. Ochai could be technically your point of attack defender, but I think we've seen he's a little better off against the kind of more wing forward types. Yeah. Um, and also, like, yeah, it's just like, mm. it's got to be, quickly has got to be better in that role, at least to the extent, like, 
Like, he's at least got to get to where they can use him like they used Dennis this year, where against most point guards, he yeah. gets that assignment initially, right. and you're not having to right. retool your deal. Like, like Quig if Quigley's going to make $22, $25 million a year, he's going to have to improve as that guy. Okay. Well, that's a separate question. Maybe yeah. we'll get to another different episode. But I think, okay, so if Gary's going to be your starter, what do you pay him? And if he's going to be your reserve, what do you pay him? Because obviously that's going to have a big impact on what do you decide to do with them. I mean, first off, I, I guess, do you guys want Gary back for next season? Both of you guys. I, I think if you can find that salary range between, you know, 12 to 15, I think that's where 12 to 15 million. I think that's where I can mm. see the fit. I wouldn't. But do you think it's easy to sell him on a pay cut? No, I, I think okay. there, there would yeah. definitely be a challenge. He's making 18 that. right now. Yeah, I, but that's where I kind of, the comparables with uh, players from last season, okay, and, uh, last off season, and what they got, right? Like you look, at Bruce, he he got four years, sixty two million, okay. So right, that's just over fifteen mil a year, and I I don't think that's fair. That's I don't fair. think people, the market is the market. Yeah. yeah, I don't think people would say that Kerry Trent Jr. is a better player than Max Truce. Yeah, m mid level projects to be about thirteen million. Um, so, you know, maybe you give him a hair, like maybe you split the difference between what he's making now and the mid level. And basically if he's not game for that, like, I don't know, like obviously these things are, are very rough metrics, mm -hmm. but he grades out to be about a three to three and a half win player. And in basketball, that's worth 11 to $14 million in the current cap environment. Um, so, you know, you could justify going a little above the mid-level because of the certainty, because he's your guy, you know, he's a culture fit and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, if he wants the deal he's currently on, certainly if he wants the type of deal that was theorized uh, when he picked up his player option, about potential extensions at that point, I think you have to just like tell him, okay, go out and beat the mid-level on the market. If you can beat the yeah, mid-level sure. from someone else, we can have that conversation. Mm -hmm. But you know, the Raptors have at times paid their guys full freight to keep them without you know like there there have been a couple times i'm not sure that deal was there somewhere else like the yaka deal i don't know that he had four years 78 million from well, he did have the else. leverage of you traded the, the pick for me so yeah. you better resign me you do yeah. and like guys you know they're they're last year they were in a bit of what i what i is called the bird rights trap where mm -hmm. if you don't resign your guys you risk them walking for nothing because you're not going to have cap space otherwise the raptors at least could get into cap space this offseason so they have a little bit of leverage in the gary negotiations if we could use this elsewhere but yeah i think that's where you're at like you could go to 15 million justify paying a premium on the mid-level because he's your guy and you know him well and things like that mm -hmm. um but beyond that i think you got to tell him go beat that deal somewhere else exactly right? and you might if you're right. going to spend okay. that much money you might as well splurge on someone else I, I, well, I, think, I mean, it would be contingent on other players being willing to take that money to come right, to Toronto for that right. role. And, and if there is a replacement, like, I will be okay. But if there's no replacement and we're just losing Gary over one or two million, then that's where I'm like, ah, I'd rather just keep him. Right. That's that's fair. Yeah. That If it comes down to that, then, you know, you would rather maintain a player on your roster. Okay. I think the other point of leverage for the Raptors as well is you've already paid for potential ones. Like, when Gary got the three-year $51 million deal, Mm -hmm. uh, he was coming off making $1.6 million the previous year. Okay, yeah. And so, as a 22-year-old, they gave him a potential deal. And so, you look at what he's accomplished in those in these three seasons, mm. you would not say that he's grown a significant amount right. in terms of what he is well, as a player. If he and did so, show that secondary skill, you know, like the defense on a consistent basis, um, playmaking, all that kind of stuff. And I feel like sometimes it does feel a little bit unfair because his role is just like to finish. Um, so it's not like all of a sudden you're like, well, where are the assists? You know, like right. the, the job is to, to to score. But also at the same time, like you would feel a lot more comfortable if you had a secondary role. The other question is just, you know, how long is it going to take Grady to get to the point where he's at Gary's level or even better? Because you would not obviously want to block him. But for me personally, if you were to re-up him for another year or two on it, like similar to what he's currently making, like it doesn't really bother me. Also, if you go that short... Yeah. then yeah you can you that's, can pay I, the extra. i think that's ultimately where they're gonna land yeah. up i don't worry that much about blocking you need more than five good players even yeah. guys coming off the bench like they they yeah. are at a talent deficit right sure. now i'm not worried about having too many good players yeah well that does it for us today i've been your host willow you've been listening to the raptor show on the sports Night radio network brought to you by campbell's new chunky spicy soup it's time to get fired up Make sure you find the raptor show where we listen to podcasts and again we are at 11 a.m that's where you'll find the show thanks once again to amit mon our board producer lance kennedy jennifer olnick david says chair of manitab for helping behind the scenes Thanks for our guest, Vivek Jacob, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.